name is John Colony. I'm president of Harrisville Designs, and I'm one of the people who was lucky enough to be able to work with Peter Collingwood on the design of the Harrisville Designs rug loom. In 1988, we decided that it would be a good project for Harrisville Designs to develop a small but effective rug loom. We asked Peter to, uh, Collingwood if he would uh, work, collaborate with us on the design. So in that year, my father and I went to his studio in Nayland, England, and spent three days trying to understand some of the issues involved in what an effective rug loom should be, and also learning some of the ideas that Peter Collingwood had incorporated into his own rug looms over his 30 or 40 years of weaving. Um, Peter, uh, as part of the collaboration, was to tell us what the rug loom should do and some of the features that it should have. My father's part of the collaboration was to try to figure out in a mechanical way how to solve the problems of making a loom do the things that Peter wanted it to do. And my part of the collaboration was to design the, the woodworking part of it. A rug loom is different from a regular loom and it has three specific needs that it has to have. First of all, it must provide and be able to maintain extreme warp tension. The second thing is it needs to have a very heavily weighted beater so that the, it is easy to build up the cloth. The heavier the beater, the easier it is to build the cloth. Much like hitting a nail with a bigger hammer is easier to drive the nail. Also, for a rug loom, the shed uh, should open up and down so that the travel of each heddle isn't very far, but the shed is large enough to weave. So that a rug loom really should be countermarched or counterbalanced in action. And the Harrisville rug loom is countermarched loom. The beater is an important part of the rug loom, um, and it has uh, several features that are uh, critical. First of all, it has to be very heavy. Peter Collingwood told us he wanted the beater to weigh one pound per weaving inch. This loom is a 45 inch loom. That means the beater must weigh 45 pounds. Um, it's uh, hung from above um, and it's pivoted on two wooden blocks which move back in these sawtooth blocks to, to expand the weaving area. Um, the beater is adjustable uh, up and down in different positions and also hangs vertically from the top of the loom. Uh, if this piece is turned around 180 degrees so that these blocks are on the back, the beater will hang at an angle away from you. So you can either have the beater hanging vertically or hanging slightly away, depending on your preference. The warp tension on the Harrisville Designs rug loom is, a, is added and applied by a worm gear mechanism, which is here on the cloth beam. And you can turn it and gain tremendous mechanical advantage and to create very, very high tension on the, on the warp. This small piece of wood covering the, covering the cloth is what we call the cloth protector for the loom. It's a piece of wood that just hangs in a bracket and keeps you from rubbing against the cloth as you're weaving. Uh, Peter, this was an idea that was actually developed on most Scandinavian looms, but Peter, Qual Peter Collingwood adapted it slightly so that by raising it, it serves the purpose of holding your shuttles on the loom so that when you beat very hard, the shuttles don't fall on your lap. The bench is a, a permanently installed uh, hanging bench that uh, allows you to adjust either up or down or in or out. And over time, most people find that the most comfortable place to weave is as high as possible because it's more comfortable to work down on your weaving than it is to work out. So this bench is very adjustable up and down, in and out. It also hangs with metal straps and can be easily folded down out of the way or you can take it off the loom completely and use some other kind of bench if you prefer. The treadles are pivoted from the back and come forward and are held in place by a treadle gate down below, which leaves, keeps the treadles, uh, even though they're quite long, it keeps them in the position so you don't have to be looking for them. You know, we also have an option available to put a lock on the treadle gates so that when a treadle is engaged, it can be locked down to, so that the harness stays up. The shaft switching device sits on top of the shafts. It's held by brackets on shaft one and four. It has a platform on the top where the sh switching levers uh, are placed. Uh, the shaft switching device needs to uh, articulate with the shafts as they're engaged so that it must turn either way as the shafts go up and down. The loom is quite solid and heavy. Uh, the 45 inch version weighs about 300 pounds. Uh, it's made of solid rock maple 
and plantation mahogany in the posts. It's held together with bolts that go into embedded nuts uh, so that it's quite rigid. It's also held side to side with tie rods that are inside this black tube here and one in the front. Uh, this apron uh, in the front is uh, a very clever uh, adaptation that Peter Collingwood developed called the dust apron. And it's just a free floating apron that protects the back of the cloth as it goes down over the breast beam. Uh, and so that if, if uh, the rug sheds dirt down onto the back of the uh, rug, it drops onto the apron instead. And you can simply reach in, pull the apron out, shake the dust off, and then place it back in uh, when you're finished. Uh, it hitches on brackets, which are right on the back side of the uh, cloth protector that I talked about uh, in the front. Uh, it also has the advantage of when the metal tie-on rods come around the breast beam, you don't catch your weft yarn on the tie-on rods because it's also protected by the dust apron. As your weaving progresses, the fell line moves toward the beater, and you therefore need to move the beater back to increase your weaving width. You do that by using your arm as a lever, lift the beater, and move it back in these notches at the top. Now the notches is a wooden pivot on a, on a wooden block, uh, and it's very uh, gentle. It doesn't seem to wear very much, and it's much quieter than a metal pivot up here. Uh, so you move it back, and then eventually, of course, you're going to completely fill the weaving width and you have to roll on more warp. And to do that, you get up from the loom, you release the tension on the warp by backing off the cloth beam. Then you go to the back of the loom and you turn this wheel in a counterclockwise fashion. And by turning the wheel, it makes this beam go down lower. And as it goes, if this goes down an inch, you see that you can roll on two inches of warp forward. So you turn this kind of clockwise, the warp sags, you come back to the front, turn on the cloth beam, move the beater forward again, beat it to get a little extra tension, tighten the warp beam again. Then you're ready to weave again. As you weave, you want to push the beater back toward the castle, because if you try to weave up here, the shed is quite small. In the back, the shed is much larger. As we were developing the loom, I asked Peter Collingwood about how large the shed should be. And he said that the shed should be only as large as it absolutely has to be to allow the shuttle to pass freely through it. If the shed is too big, it works the warp too much. So the shed needs to be just big enough for the shovel that you're using. If you don't like to push the warp beam if you, don't, if you don't like to push the beater back as you weave, 
you can arrange it so that it hangs at an angle at all times. So at rest, it hangs away from you, giving you a bigger shed automatically. <clears throat> Okay, I'm sitting underneath the loom at the back, uh, and this is the bank of lambs. One of the things that's different about this loom from other looms is that many countermarsh looms have the lambs on two different levels. The short lambs might be higher than the long lambs. Uh, Peter liked the idea of having all the lambs on one level here. So you have long lambs and short lambs all at the same level. Now with countermarsh tie up, each treadle has to be tied to one of the two lambs that correspond to each shaft. So with four shafts, you have four pairs of lambs, one short and one long in each pair. You must have a chain either hitched to a long lamb or a short lamb for that pair. So each treadle has four chains. The tie-up is accomplished with a stainless steel ball chain with an eye at the end. And to hitch it to the lamb, you just have to put the eye in the eye here and then let go and it's hitched. If you want to raise your uh, treadles, so your, if, for instance, your legs are short, you want your treadles to ride higher, you can move the eye down the chain in another position, and then when you clip it on, the treadle rides higher than normal. So you can raise all the treadles up to reach your feet if your feet are short. So you can adjust even the treadles. One of the cleverest ideas of Peter Collingwood's that we've incorporated into the loom is the so-called warp extender. What the warp extender is, is a mechanism that allows you to pull out enough warp to weave an entire rug. Uh, and you never then introduce new warp from the warp beam while you're weaving that rug. Peter came up with this idea when he was given a commission to weave a rug to fit in a recess in a floor. And it had to be perfectly spaced from salvage to salvage within an eighth of an inch. So to do that, he had to have absolutely perfect tension, and he came up with the idea of the warp extender to give him that kind of tension. The way it works is this tube travels up and down these threaded rods, and it's positioned by this wheel over on this side beside me, and if I turn the wheel, it causes the threaded rod to move, and the tube then travels up and down the threaded rod. So you begin weaving a rug with the tube all the way at the top, and it's a three and a half foot stroke. And for every inch that the tube comes down, you can roll on two inches forward. So the three and a half foot stroke gives you a seven foot rug possibility. If you need a longer rug, you can either unroll the warp beam and give you more warp or add an extension to the posts and you can extend the warp extender further up. And we have done as much as a two foot extension of the warp extender. So now if you wanted to roll on warp, you'd come back, you'd turn this wheel in a counterclockwise fashion and it causes the tube to go down and you'll see the warp slack. Once the tube is down enough I go to the front of the loom, turn the cloth beam to pull the tension back up. Um, and then what it does is it enables you to maintain the tension that you begin the rug with all the way to the end of the rug. It doesn't fix your, your tension. It's not magic, but if you tie on perfectly to begin with, it will end the rug with the same tension that you start with. When you get down to this position, you're almost at the end of your rug. When you get to the end, you cut off the warp. You then undo the warp beam. You unroll enough. You move the tube back to the top so that you have the full extension of the warp extender again. You tie on the next rug at the front, and you're ready to start weaving. So you can put as much warp on the warp beam as you like, enough for 10 rugs or 20 rugs, even more if you like, and each rug is then tensioned and tied separately. Through the warp extender, the tension is maintained throughout the rug. This is what the warp extender looks like when it's further up, almost fully extended. This is all the warp right across here, or half of it, the other half is on the other side, that you're going to need for that rug. So to roll on again, turn the reel, That causes this beam to slowly come down so you can roll on at the front. One of the points that Peter Collingwood raised as we were designing the loom was to remind us that you should be able to weave fabric on a rug loom. 
it's just difficult to weave rugs on a fabric loom. So he, he was urged us not to do anything to the loom that would make it more difficult to weave fabric on it. And by that, basically he meant two things. Number one, in most countermarsh looms, the cords that cause the shafts to go up run down through the center of the warp down to the lambs. Now, if your warp is coarse, as in most rugs, three, four, six ends per inch, it doesn't make any difference if cords are running through the middle of the warp. But if you have 30 ends to the inch in your warp, then you don't want these cords running down through the center of the warp. So what we've done is we've diverted the cords that raise the shafts over to the right side of the castle and down to the long lambs. So they never pass directly through the warp. They're diverted to the right. The other thing that Peter suggested was that the beater, that it be possible that the beater be made lighter. Now this beater has to weigh 45 pounds because it's a 45 inch loom. But almost 20 pounds of that weight is, is provided by metal uh, weights that are screwed to the bottom of the beater. And those metal weights are easily removed all the way across in any sequence you like to lighten up the beater so that you can actually get a lighter beat, which is a better um, for weaving fabric. One of the unique features of the loom is the option of using the Collingwood shaft switching device. Now, shaft switching and the shaft switching device is actually uh, not very complicated, although it seems complicated at first. It's a device that sits here on this bracket on top of the shafts, and it has levers. And if you can move the levers, you can make the threading of your loom change. It makes those warp ends feel that instead of being on shaft four, they're on shaft one. And by changing the threading, and you can change the way the cloth appears. So for instance, if you weave with two colors, in this case yellow and purple, you always weave yellow first, then purple. If all the levers are forward and you weave yellow, purple, yellow, purple, you'll end up with a rug that's yellow on one side and purple on the other. If you move a lever, you cause the color from the back to come to the front. So where this lever is turned, where this lever is turned to the back, it makes the purple in this block come from the back of the rug to the face. So any design that you can draw, you can weave simply by moving these levers. Now the way it works is that the loom is threaded with a warp end on shaft two. The next warp end is not threaded through any heddle, but this cord is threaded through a heddle on shaft one and a heddle on shaft four and the warp end passes through a hole in the cord. So when the lever is forward, that warp end is activated by the heddle on shaft four. When that cord is, when the lever is back, the warp end is activated by the heddle on shaft one. There's a little blue mark on the cord, which you can see it, which is where the warp end passes through it. So again, when the warp, when the lever is back, it's on shaft one, when it's forward, it's on shaft four. So you're basically tricking that warp end into thinking it's on one shaft or the other. And by simply moving the lever, you actually can manipulate the color on the face of the rug to come back up from the back. If I can actually make it happen um, as I'm traveling, if you can uh, imagine this three ends in this position right here. There, in this three ends, there are two ends down and one end up. If I were weaving the color yellow, because there's only one end up, that color will show on the face of the rug. But if in this block I could make two ends come up and one stay down, then the color would go to the back of the rug. So as I move the lever, you can see the warp end come up. See the warp end come up. Now, in that same three end shed, I'm sorry, in that same three end block, I've got two up and one down, and if I throw yellow, it goes to the back of the rug. Here, that color's on the face of the rug. Here, it's on the back of the rug. And that's all there is to the shaft switching, and you do it all the way across. If you're weaving a symmetrical pattern, you might want to number your levers from the center, one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, all the way out. So that if you do this to number seven, if you move number seven, you can move this number seven, and your rug would be symmetrical. If you're doing something asymmetrical, you might 
number the levers 1 through 84. And then you have a piece of graph paper with a design on it. And if the design says move number 53, you'll move the one mark 53. So if you have a rug that's a repeating design, you actually only have to worry about a small section of the shaft switching device and just then repeat it as you go across. But it's an extremely clever um, device. It's very simple to use. And it's probably one of the really true innovations in weaving that's come along in the last two or 3,000 years. Uh, it's a very simple system uh, developed by Peter Collingwood over the last uh, 30 years and uh, it works very well. Uh, warping the loom is not that difficult and uh, as with most looms there are several different ways that warping can be done. Uh, the way that we found to be the easiest is to warp from front to back. So the first thing is you would uh, thread the reed, then thread the heddles. If the shaft switching device is on, you find it best to thread the uh, shaft switching devices with the levers all halfway up. That way all the blue marks on the cords are in the middle and they're easy to find. So you thread through the harnesses, tie onto the rod in the back, and then come back to the front, pull out the warp chain, and then put tension on in the front by just combing out the warp in the front. And we found that it's best if two people uh, do this process so that one person can hold the tension in the front while another person cranks on in the back. Okay, you start cranking. point in the warping process, if you were warping by yourself and you wanted to add a tensioning device, you could add a tensioning device in this area right here, attached to both sides of the loom. It also might be a good time, it might be a good time to add a rattle on top of this tube here so you can space your warp evenly before it goes on the beam. To do that, you can just reach underneath, poke it up between these beams, and bring it right up on top of the front beam. And then hold it in place with some tape. So you have a rattle just to keep your warp evenly spaced. To put the shaft switching device on a loom, uh, you first of all have to take the regular shafts off. First thing you must do is put the skewer through the jacks. By sliding the skewer through these jacks, what that does is it supports the shafts so that when it's disconnected, the lambs don't fall on the floor because with the countermarsh loom, it's the warp that holds everything up. So you put the skewer in. The next step is to disconnect the short chains that go from the shafts to the short lambs. So they're disconnected underneath. Then you support the shafts, just undo the cables. Lift the four shafts out front. And just set them down. Pick up the shaft switching device. Now the shaft switching device comes out of the box exactly as you see that. All threaded up with the cords and the levers on the top. And four shafts hitched together. Drop it into the loom. Like this. There's a spring and a chain support. And then the cables just get hooked to the corners of the shafts as before. All right. Now we'll take this cord off. This cord just is supporting shaft two and three when it's empty. Then the last thing is that two dowels get inserted between shafts one and two and between shafts three and four. And the purpose of the dowel is as you're moving the levers of the shaft, shaft switching device, 
it keeps shaft one and four from wanting to work together. There's a holder, just lift it up, straight up, way up. Okay? So it's going to slot on both sides. Then you hitch the short chains to the short lambs again at the bottom, and you're ready to weave. That's all there is to it. Each loom comes with its own owner's manual, uh, which is a booklet five, divided into five sections. First section is assembly, then adjustment, then a section on weaving, a section on maintenance, and a section written by Peter Collingwood on shaft switching. So the owner's manual has many of the details we've gone over here, but also it should answer any of the questions you have about technical issues with the loom. <clears throat> That completes our description of the Harrisville rug loom. It's certainly been the finest loom that Harrisville Designs uh, has been, had the pleasure of building. Uh, it arrived uh, in the world in 1989 and uh, almost virtually as you see it today. Uh, all of that credit goes to Peter Collingwood who over 30 or 40 years uh, was a master weaver, an incredibly clever person uh, who developed many of the ideas that are incorporated in this loom and we'll be ever, forever grateful to him for collaborating with us on the design. I think it's a great loom, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs>